Hepatitis C is a virus that is transmitted by blood-to-blood -blood contact. So it's very common in people who've had poor quality medical practice or people who use drugs and inject drugs into their veins. Once you have the virus, the virus will go to the liver. And once the virus is in the liver, over 20, 30, 40 years, it will slowly cause the liver to scar and eventually the liver will reach a stage cirrhosis. Once you have liver cirrhosis from hepatitis C, you have a very high chance of getting a liver cancer or the liver failing. So it's really important that we find people with hepatitis C before they have cirrhosis, before their liver is permanently damaged. What is the most effective form of treatment for hepatitis C? We now have a large number of different treatments. They're all tablet-based treatments. They're all very effective. They all have very few side effects. And I think we can now safely say to our patients with hepatitis C, if you take the tablets, you'll get cured. How was your experience with interferon when you were treated with interferon? How was it? It was terrible. It was like a, a chemotherapy. I had like so many side effects with high fever, muscular pains, uh, my hair fell out, my skin became very dry. I coped with depressions one after another. I felt suicidal sometimes. Uh, I felt very weak. I've done it for one year. It didn't work, but it was very hard. How is the new treatment compared to that? So there's no, nothing to compare. It's very easy to, to take. I didn't feel no side effects. How does it feel now after hepatitis C? I feel lighter and I feel like I don't have like any more nothing in my body that one day would kill me like it did to some friends of mine and families. If you inject drugs, you will very often share needles, you will share syringes, the paraphernalia, the so-called works, and that puts you at very high risk of infection. But these are the people who are likely to pass the virus on. And in my view, these are the people we need to target treatment so we can stop the virus in its tracks. These are exactly the people who are excluded in several countries from treatment. Why is it so? This is pure stigma, pure bias. The WHO makes very clear that everyone should be treated. The EASL and the American Liver Associations all recommend that everyone should get treatment. So there is no excuse for not treating people who inject drugs because they're the groups who need it most. In the UK, so major barriers for people who inject drugs um, a stigma, they don't want to disclose. This is a particular issue for uh, women who have children. They may not want to be identified as a drug user. So even asking for a hepatitis C test may inadvertently out them. Doctors also um, create barriers by um, refusing to treat people who inject drugs, creating um, requirements that people cease injecting or people cease using particular drugs when that's actually not supported by national and international guidelines. We feel like we don't deserve to ask for treatments because we were told like you destroy your health so much how come you are like demanding for better health and that is a, a label that is hard to take. When we speak about drug users who are more than 90% of new infections, we have also to speak about criminalization because that is a huge barrier to go to any uh, treatment, to any health treatment, and that is something what needs to be addressed. Why do you think the testing level of, of migrant populations is so low? Lack of awareness. First of all, lack of awareness. Um, you know, systems are challenging, but if there is good information, appropriate, culturally appropriate, in languages people can understand, it's much easier for people to be, uh, you know, insensitized. Many people say that the drug is very expensive, so it's not, uh, you know, governments can afford it. What would you be your message to governments? The message to governments is very simple. You either pay now or you pay much more later. Because if you don't treat hepatitis C early, when it's easy to treat, it will cause cirrhosis, it will cause liver cancer, and that's even more expensive to treat. So the most effective way, the most cost-effective way of treating hepatitis C is treat it early, treat it in people using drugs so they don't transmit it. You'll spend a lot less money than waiting till people are dying of the disease. One of the major barriers, and that's largely recognized 
is the price of the new treatment. When there is a patent, um, when there is the monopoly, there is only one company allowed to sell the product. So basically, the company can ask for whatever the price they want. USA, we have, like, Sovaldi was priced around $80,000. It was called the 1,000 pill. Generic medicine is today available for $200, um, the cure, so it's much more cheaper. It's just the same drug, but it is manufactured by someone else than the patent holder. At Médecins du Monde, we are advocating for uh, countries to better negotiate prices and use the legislation that allow country to suspend uh, patent and intellectual property rights to allow for generic uh, production or import. Many pharmaceutical companies claim that they keeping the prices high because they need a lot of money for research and innovation. Sophos BV is a molecule that has been developed by a small American firm uh, called Pharmacet that spent let's say millions of uh, dollars to develop the drug. The patent has simply been bought by Gilead Science for 11 billion of dollars. So the price paid by Gilead has actually nothing to do with the cost of the development of this drug. For many uh, countries, uh, hepatitis treatment for a huge population is not um, achievable. But at the same time, we see that pricing prices are going down, that in some countries, also in Europe, the prices are quite affordable, for example in Spain. In other countries, it's uh, more than 10 times expensive. So that is a very uh, curious situation and uh, uh, we saw uh, examples of civil society and advocacy, for example in Georgia and other countries, that they can they achieve great successes in bringing prices down. you call a, a, an excellent, excellent example of uh, national hepatitis C response? Like, can you maybe tell us uh, some concrete examples? Well, we had uh, exciting examples from my perspective, for, again from Scotland. If you want to do something, it is so easy. You can deliver the drugs via pharmacies, community pharmacies, which are reachable in a range of 20 minutes from, from every uh, patient. You can go to the pharmacy, you, have, you make your test and you get your pills. There is no uh, medical specialists needed anymore and we also have excellent examples in, 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 in Europe, for example the Swedish Drug User Union who, who established user academies where they teach each other on an, an HCV uh, pr uh, prevention and so on. So that is really amazing to see and that is the most effective way to do it. What, what do governments need to do to eliminate uh, hepatitis C? It needs to be well planned and developed into a national hepatitis strategy and also a national action plan. That's an important starting point and to bring everybody together. And very importantly, among the stakeholders, there needs to be the community and civil society. Really, nothing can move forward without good community engagement and activity. One of the important things in terms of the Australian story is, is the role of the community and, and how much involvement they had in terms of discussing with the government and working with the government to really advocate for access for all. So no restrictions based on disease stage, no restrictions based on drug and alcohol use, and then to allow for broadened prescribing by general practitioners so it's not restricted by specialists. And what's amazing is that, you know, uh, we've you know, had these therapies since, since March of last year. And you know, there's 230,000 people with hepatitis C in Australia, and, and we have treated uh, 30,000 people in nine months of these new therapies being available. We've cured more people last year than we have in, in two decades of, of interferon-based therapies. Why harm reduction is important in uh, people getting access to treatment of Hep C. Harm reduction is a program based on outreach approach when, when the peers, when the people from community trying to reach those who are usually hard to reach. Um, th this is really works. We have a great hepatologist in Belgium 
and he made the difference for me when I was in hospital for other diseases. I had lung problems. And he came to my bed and he said, you know, there is something we can do about your hep C. And now this hepatologist is my colleague and we have our C buddy project with him. And it shows that drug users, a good hepatologist and a low threshold center, this, I call this the triangle, that this works very well. What can we learn from, from the literature about reinfections? Is it a real risk that if we treat people, they will reinfect with the same behavior? I think we've got to be very aware of that risk in some populations and to study it and monitor it. I think we've been reassured by some studies and very importantly among the injecting drug users their extremely good response to treatment even if they're actively using drugs. So I think the important message is that we need to monitor this carefully should never be a reason for not treating, but we need to make sure that treatment is always linked to prevention and good harm reduction educational messages. What would you recommend to other drug users who are still live with the virus? I recommend that they demand the human right to health, even if they choose to keep on doing drugs. We have the right to health, we have the right to meds, and if there is a cure, let's go and get it. Because there's no use dying of a disease when there is a cure, and very easy to do.